Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Jay has laid out the concept of thankfulness, and um, I think that's a wonderful way to come at this this year. Think about the times when you have truly been thankful, and think about sometimes what that compels you to do, the, the extreme happiness, the ecstasy that you feel because you may not feel worthy of, of that, that, has, that you've been blessed with. So that's a wonderful thing, and what a motivator that is. Thank you to Rob Clemens, our treasurer. Thank you to the Finance Committee, and thanks to the Vestry for allowing me to chair this again this year. Um, and so I'll start out by saying the same thing I said last year. I love you. I'm now in my 31st year at Grace Episcopal Church, and I love you. I know so many of you very well, and I know that you love me too. This is what Jesus Christ commanded us to do above all else, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. For some of you, I'm only now getting to know you, and I still really look forward to that. But before I start, I want to acknowledge some advice, reference, and input from my consultant son, <laughs> Reverend Daniel Strandlund at St. Elizabeth Episcopal Church in Buda, Texas. It's certainly nice to have so close of a relative you can go to for advice along the lines of stewardship, because I know he'll be talking about it in a few weeks as well. It's stewardship time. It's time for all of us to think about what kind of church we want to be in the year of 2020, which will soon be upon us. This is a time of great opportunity for our parish. Things have certainly changed a lot since I spoke to you last year at this time. Father Jay has been with us for almost a year, and I feel and see a positive momentum for Grace Episcopal Church going into 2020. Don't you feel it too? One of the most important things we must do now is to work together in a united effort to move forward as one group. We must be dedicated to all things necessary to demonstrate that God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are present among us and foremost in our thoughts and plans for the future. And so I ask you to think hard about our upcoming 2020 stewardship program. Because I think that if we bind together in the love we are asked by our Savior to have for each other, we will realize that as we did last year, and for those of you who remember, our theme was, the best is yet to come. But this year, it's even better. And I give you, the best is yet to come to the sequel. <laughs> And this time, the sequel better be better than the original. So first, I'd like to talk to you about pledging. It's my hope and my expectation that everyone who calls Grace Church home will make a financial pledge for 2020. I hope this because pledging is spiritually good for us. I expect it because it's linked with our identity as Christians in the Episcopal Church. So let's take a moment to think about these two concepts, hope and expectation. My hope is that everyone will pledge because as a practice, pledging is good for us spiritually. We are a people of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is a way of saying that the most important aspect of our, aspects of our futures our redemption as daughters and sons of God is already accomplished by God on our behalf. And so to make a pledge is to practice in the present the security in God's future. We make pledges each fall for the upcoming year as a way of offering to God our future in advance, regardless of what that future might contain. And so to paraphrase Matthew, where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. By promising to God the first fruits of our financial futures in the coming year, 
we also promise to God our hearts for the coming year. That's why I hope this for us, because it's good for us. Now, what about that second word, expectation? A little bit scarier. I expect that everyone will pledge, not only because it's practically helpful as we plan for 2020, but because the practice of pledging is consonant or consistent with our identity as Episcopalians. Christianity, as you know, is a collection of practices, weekly worship, prayer, care for the needy, pursuing peace and kindness, studying the Bible. And these practices form us into a particular direction, so to speak. The Eucharist, Eucharisto, as Jay said, for example, the Great Thanksgiving, is a practice of corporate worship given to us by Jesus. Practic practic excuse me, practicing it forms us into a more and more perfect image of God, which is to say, it forms us into Christ's likeness the perfect image of God. And that's from Colossians 1.15. We receive Christ's body and blood each week so that we might become more and more like Christ himself. Now I say all this because offering to God of our first fruits is a Christian practice that none of us gets to decide is unimportant. Certain aspects of being Christian people just simply aren't up for grabs or discussion. Giving of our first fruits is one of those. So why pledge? The tradition of Christianity that you and I inhabit is the Episcopal Church. Our room has its own particular understanding of Christian practices, our own flavor of life. We celebrate Eucharist like this. We understand the authority of the Bible like this. When the bishop comes to visit, we do things like this. One of our practices in the Episcopal room of God's house is that we take vows, we promise. We do, the, we do this at baptisms, we do it at confirmations, we do it at weddings. Simply put, pledging is just another kind of vow. Pledging is only one kind of giving, but it is an avowed practice of giving that fits with our understanding of Christian culture as Episcopalians. And so, it's my expectation that we will behave accordingly. You know, some of us resist pledging because we fear making a commitment we might break. This is certainly understandable, and this resistance comes from a virtuous place, the conviction that we all should keep our word. As Christians, however, we believe that our calling in following Jesus is faithfulness, not perfection. For example, during every bishop's visit and at every baptism, each of us reaffirm our avowed commitment to respect the dignity of every human being. Yet none of us would ever claim to fulfill that vow perfectly. Moreover, I doubt that any of us expects to fulfill that vow perfectly in the year to come. But we do expect to get better at it, day in and day out, little bits at a time. So, if we don't think twice about promising to strive for peace and justice among all people, why would we ever hesitate to promise something as simple as money? Now, the amount of money you give is for no one to decide but you, your family, and God. Whatever step God is calling you to take this year, however, I hope and expect that you will give it a try. It may be that the practice brings you a greater sense of abundance in your life. It may be that by this time next year you decide you tried a bit too much, or maybe not quite enough. Remember. Our goal is faithfulness, not getting it exactly right. We're all still practicing. Part of the grace of being people who take vows is that when we make a vow, we are usually promising an unlimited amount of time 
whether to God or to a person or to a community. Our baptismal vows reaffirmed at confirmation, for example, they don't have an expiration date. We're promising to do this for as long as we walk the earth. There's grace in this because it means that there's no hard deadline for success. Only met 90% of your pledge this year? That's okay. Pledging is a lifelong practice and we renew it each year. And another way is on its, year, on its way already. Only 25% of your pledge met because of those medical bills or the house you lost in a storm. That's also okay. Another year is on its way already. Our whole futures, not just partial futures, are in God's hands. And God has promised us an unlimited amount of time on this side of the grave and beyond in which to grow into the full stature of Christ, his Son. We have seasons of feast and famine, of rising and falling. We are each one of us always starting over on our journey into holiness. And that's okay. This is the church. And Grace Church is your church. A community of ordinary people on an extraordinary journey. And a journey worth taking may involve our falling down a time or two. But God does not ask for our perfection, only our faithfulness. Our best efforts are pleasing to him, however small or insignificant or imperfect that they may seem to us. Everything and everyone belong. And so I ask you to remember this quote from Dr. Alan Hunt. Jesus Christ cares more about your future than he does about your past. We can't live in the past, but we can learn from it. We can't live in the future because we know that we also can do our best to plan for it. So what's left? The present. What's left is to make the most of the present, the now. And so our journey, begun and continued together, should have the altar of God and the table of the Holy Eucharist as its destination. That's where it's pointing. That's where we're heading. This destination contains everything we need to be a unified and healthy parish, one that gives and gives and gives. Treasure, time, and talent are all what we need again during 2020. And so, Will you grow with us? Look around you. Look up. Look to your side. Look behind you. This beautiful worship space and the building is not the church. We are the church. Now, are you ready to be the church? Are you ready to be thankful? Thank you, my friends.